Today on Straight Talk Africa, the 2018 FIFA World Cup is over and France is the new World Cup champions. The five African teams that participated in Russia, Nigeria, Egypt, Senegal, Morocco and Tunisia were knocked out in the preliminary rounds of the highly competitive soccer fiesta. We'll discuss the World Cup finale and have an in-depth look at the Confederation of African Football or CAF nations that competed in the global extravaganza. That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa live from the Voice of America headquarters in Washington. I'm Peter Clotty. Shaka Sali is on assignment. And hello to all of our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick and I will be your social media reporter. Today we'll discuss the World Cup finale and have an in-depth look at the Confederation of African Football Nations that competed in the global extravaganza. And coming up later, our audience has weighed in on our topic through emails, Facebook and Twitter comments. We'll reveal some of them ahead here on Straight Talk Africa. The 2018 FIFA World Cup wrapped up on Sunday with France winning the coveted cup. Hope for five African teams were dashed during the preliminary rounds in what viewers around the world agree was a highly competitive tournament. Viewers Esther Githui Ewart has more. The 22nd FIFA World Cup is now history and France is holding its head high as the clear winner, defeating Croatia with four goals to two. Daniel Brown, a multimedia production specialist with VOA, reflects on the French win. They did an outstanding job. They played to their performance, they played to the, the form that they're in right now. They played at an extremely high level. Um, actually, when, you, when you're watching them play, they're playing in a fancy kind of mindset. Um, they had these crazy passes. They actually had a lot of crazy good goals. No question Russia was a great host for the Cup, with a total of 64 matches played in 11 cities and 12 venues that also included five African nations, Nigeria, Senegal, Egypt, Tunisia, and Morocco. Unfortunately, they were all eliminated early on. So what went amiss? Baba Makeri is an international broadcaster with VOA's House of Service. We always love the teamwork. To play as a team in Africa sometimes is a little bit problem because uh, uh, most of our players, they play with the, um, together with the Europeans and then the Asians and then the uh, South Americans. But unfortunately when they come home, that is where the problem is. We, don't, we, we can't play as a team. Yakuba Wedra Ogo, a sports reporter with VOA's French to Africa service. When you get team and you got high level, the player of high level in the same team and we are of lower, lower yeah. Yeah, it could be good because you can put them together and make a team. But most of African teams, when you look at them playing, you feel that they can begin an action. And at the end, maybe somebody miss his action and everything. So something missing. I asked Daniel what he thought drives African soccer players to play for foreign countries. A lot of players look at it as, where can I get playing time? So a lot of people from French or African descent, they can play for their home country. But the thing is, will they get noticed? Will they get playing time? Is there a chance for them to actually be successful? At only 19 years of age, Kylian Mbappe has won the hearts of many. His mother is Algerian and his father Cameroonian. I mean, watching him play and all the excitement, and especially from African fans who say this is one of our own. Yeah. Where do you see him in the next couple of years? I see him becoming the face of FIFA. Um, even though he plays for PSG, um, he has a lot to learn, a lot of skills to improve on. Um, he can actually do a lot better with, you know, the team he has, the friends he has. He can be um, the captain of the team now after in the next four years. Um, in the next eight years, I can see him winning another, another FIFA World Cup. The U.S. is expected to co-host the 2026 World Cup alongside Canada and Mexico. During a joint press conference at the U.S.-Russia summit in Finland Monday, Russia's President Vladimir Putin handed a football to President Donald Trump 
telling him the ball That's is right. in his Thank court. You very much. We do host it, and we hope we do as good a job. That's very nice. That will go to my son, Baron. We have no question. In fact, Melania, here you go. <laughs> You know, for many of the African fans who really wanted to see an African team win the World Cup, perhaps we shouldn't be so disappointed because out of the 23 players for France, 14 of them were of African descent. Esther Guido Ewart, the VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Esther. Joining us here in studio is my colleague Mohamed Al Shanawi, a VOA international broadcaster who was in Russia at the 2018 World Cup. Welcome to you, Mohammed. Thank you. Later in the program, we will give our audience a chance to call in with your question or comment. The number to call is 202-619-3111, and the U.S. country code is one. So, uh, Mohammed, let me ask you, give us your impression regarding the 2018 World Cup. You were there in Russia. Um, you felt the environment and the crowd cheering, the African team's performances there. Tell us about your experience. Well, first of all, it was very organized. I mean, I went to Russia for the first time in my life. So, and I uh, covered the World Cup for the Voice of America in Italy in 1990. And I can tell that the Russians were very impressive in the way they organized. They have ample security, but no intrusion. So it was safe, organized. And the uh, big uh, thing that was added to any previous ones is the Fan Fest. Fan Fest, uh, Russia has a lot of squares and uh, large places. So it would could accommodate up to 15,000 spectators from all the world watching on a big screen and getting to know each other. Um, the crowds, uh, because the tickets were issued following a certain team. I was following the Egyptian team because it was a private uh, trip. So uh, they would sit you with your own countrymen. Right. So. While that happens, you can see the uh, spirit of the competing teams, spectators, was very good, very clean. Actually, when Russia uh, won the game against Egypt, a lot of spectators from the Russian crowd came hugging us, saying, we are glad that you made it, and uh, don't make that uh, spoil your stay here. It was very nice. And the uh, transportation, the Russians organized uh, the public transportation to be free in the day of the game. So you just wear your uh, fan ID and you are allowed to go to the stadium back and forth for free. So everything was organized. Even when I had a bad accident, when I lost my passport the first day, the police was very helpful. They found the passport in two days. They brought it from the airplane that went back to Moscow. So uh, while the language was a barrier for most of the old generation, it was not for the young generation. They had teams of young uh, boys and girls who can speak English fluently at the airport, at the stadiums, helping us. So uh, altogether, it was very nice experience. I, I see that you're wearing Mo Saleh's uh, shirt, um, looking at the way the Egyptians performed at the World Cup. What were some of the feedback that you got from Egypt and, uh, and in Russia as well? Actually, uh, in the stadium, the Egyptians were attending by numbers that never happened before. I was in Italy in 1990, and the Egyptian team was cheered by a thousand people. In this uh, tournament, it was 15 to 20,000 people came from Egypt, paid a lot of money. They were rocking the, the, the seats, cheering for Egypt, and they felt let down when their team never won a game. So I would say the performance of the crowd was much better than the performance of the team. A lot of critics said the Egyptian team, the Pharaohs, 
heavily depended on Mo Salah. Yeah. Because he was injured, the team seemed to fizzle out during the crucial parts of the tournament. And that prevented them from at least qualifying to the knock first knockout stage, the 116th stage. Do you share that uh, assessment? And do you think the coach helped the course of the Faroes in their determination to at least qualify to the next round? To the latter part, yes. He did well preparing the team to qualify. However, uh, I disagree with the assessment that Mohamed Salah was the key player. The problem was you cannot rely on one player to produce good results. The first game against Uruguay, Salah was not playing, and that was the best game the Egyptian team played because they didn't rely on a player. The two other games, they relied on him, and the, the real problem was the coach uh, strategy was to be on the defense all the time. How would you produce a goal if you are in your uh, third back of your uh, field? Uh, the coach was a real problem, and the team didn't play well together while they had eight international players that are playing in Europe. That doesn't make any sense. Thanks, Mohamed al Shanawi, for sharing uh, his World Cup experience with us. We'll be back after a short break. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective, things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique, and this gives me that uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111, U.S. Country Code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question, keep your comment brief, and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Now in studio with me are Lami Ademu, a former Nigerian international and a member of the Super Falcons, the senior national women's team to the 2000 Olympic soccer tournament in Sydney, Australia, and Ni Akwete, an African policy analyst and activist. Welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for having much. us. All right, so let me, let me come to you, Lami. What were your impressions of the performance of the African teams at the just ended World Cup in Russia? Um, overall, it was, uh, they did their best. It was a good performance, but I thought we could do better. We could go beyond uh, second round quarterfinals. And the hope for all of us was to get to the finals, uh, but we didn't. Um, the performance was, was okay. Just okay. okay? It was okay. <laughs> they could do better. Right, Neil, let me come to you. Your yeah. thoughts? Yes, I, I, I am afraid I give the five African teams even less uh, uh, kudos than does uh, Lamine. Now, of course, she played on the big stage, which I never came close to, and usually the bystanders are the harshest critics. Mm -hmm. So I'm keeping to that tradition. I think our five African teams to, to uh, uh, really did very badly. This is the first time since 1982 that no African country made it into the round of 16. I think it's a, we, we are going backwards. It's a, it's a tragedy. So we actually need to look. Both the uh, football organizations in each African country as well as uh, continentally, even including the African Union. I think football is serious business, it's good for the countries because it's the people's game, so governments need to take it seriously and the football associations need to take it seriously. And we well, need to do much better. Uh, Lamine, the Nigerians call football the opium of the people. Looking at the Super Eagles at the World Cup, were you impressed with their performance? 
Um, not totally. Um, we have, Nigeria is a huge country, a country of over 160 million people. Um, in my opinion, we could get uh, better players and more experienced players. But the coach did his groundwork, and I believe and in his thought, he got the best players uh, for the country um, that represented us in the World Cup. And he is in charge, and that's what he gave us, and uh, they went and did their best. Well, I, I remember wrong when he coached the Gabonese national team. Uh, they, when they organized the um, African Cup of Nations, I saw them uh, in Libreville and how they played, mm -hmm. well organized and all that. Some thought that with the skill set that Nigerian players possessed, playing in the highest leagues around the world, they thought Nigeria could have done a little bit better. Critics in Nigeria were saying that he put players in strange positions that it they did not get the full potential of them coming out, and, and that affected their performance. Do, do you share that assessment? Yes, I do. Um, like the, our first match, Musa didn't start, and he's one of the experienced players he have on the, on the team, he had on the team. Um, one of the things that really, really uh, killed Nigeria in this World Cup, in my opinion, was the experience. Musa played the second goal. He played incredibly well, and he scored two goals. Um, young players are good, but experience is always better. Um, like the Roshan, they brought out their defender out of almost 10 years of retirement. They brought him back, not because he's uh, the best player, but he had the experience. And he took their team to the round of 16. We can have a mixture of young players and experienced players, where the experienced players can lead the, the young players. They can motivate them. Um, there's a different feel when you play with somebody that is experienced, that has that exposure. Not that they don't have, they all play international, so that they have some sort of exposure. Uh, ex Mikhail's OB's experience is different from some of the new guys. And um, the, the older guys, the experienced guys, they played really well. And they helped pull the team along, but it wasn't good enough. Me, l let me come to you. Sure. Some saw mistakes and offenses committed by African players, despite the fact that they play in the most, whatever you call it, in yes. Europe. Yes. It was like they were naive in there. People were very sharply critical of the Nigerian defender who basically was hugging a player for like 10 consecutive seconds. And it's a foul. He should know better. That is what critics told me. Your take? I, 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 I would agree with that, but I wouldn't blame the players. I blame the coaches because I think, you know, when you look at the game, it seems to me it's like a chess a chess game and the one moving the pieces are the coaches so I actually think that one of the areas that African countries uh, should look at is how to develop good coaches really um, it comes from watching I watch as many games as I could of course I was cheering for every African African country and I thought the consistent one of the consistent weaknesses I saw Yes, we have great players with great talent, and they play, as you, as you implied, in the top leagues in the world, in Europe, the Premier League, La Liga, you name it. So it's not that they are not good players. They are very good, but they weren't coached well. We were outcoached. Africa was outcoached. We were also outorganized. The other thing I saw was each player, each great player, when he gets the ball, it's like, okay, I'm going to do it alone. On the other hand, you watch the Croatians, you watch the French, you watch the, the, the Spanish, and they were like a team, okay? Every time you see the ball goes where it's supposed to go, somebody is there, it's not one person saying, I'm going to carry the team on my back. And therefore, I think the, our weakness was being out coached. We had great players, but they, each one was doing their own thing. We were not well organized, and we were out coached. We need to look at our developing very good African coaches. Bani, we had 
international coaches, except Senegal, having a local coach. Right. But we'll come back and talk about that. Before sure. pausing for a short break, we want to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now streaming live on Facebook. To watch our show, just enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa. And don't forget to share it with your friends. We're on Twitter and we are tweeting live. Follow us at VOA Shaka, that's VOA Shaka, and join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA World Cup and we'll air some of your comments later in the show. We'll be right back. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question. Keep your comment brief and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back. Before we went away, we were talking about the coaches. Yes. Four of the five coaches that coached the African teams at the World Cup were foreign coaches. They were not locally based coaches. Uh, you had Cissé from Senegal, who was a former player yes. and coached the team. Yes. So what happened? They are supposed to be experienced. They're supposed to have the technical know-how. The boys were supposed to listen to them. And the FA, the federations of all the countries, repose such great confidence in them, what happened? I think the first thing that happened was that they were foreign coaches. They were not African coaches. In fact, my point is that we should find people like Mr. Sisi from Senegal all over the continent. I mean, what we do is we find somebody who is a great player, and then we look at him and say, are you interested in coaching? And if they say yes, then we say, okay, you coach. I'm th I think that we should have a systematic program where we encourage and develop uh, coaches from among people who are playing because it takes a different set of skills. So the reason I think, yes, we had foreign coaches, but I'm saying that's exactly the problem because, as you know, our FAs actually mistreat local coaches as opposed to foreign coaches. And these foreign coaches are retreads, okay? They are people over their prime. The Europeans don't give us their best coaches. They give us coaches who are over the hill and who uh, get paid much more than they are paid, uh, uh, local coaches are paid. So I actually think we need to focus on coaching. We need to say we're going to find good indigenous African coaches. And most of all, we are going to train them. We just don't say because you were a good striker or a good defender or a good goalie, now you are the coach. It requires training, it requires thinking, it requires strategizing, it requires organizing the team. Uh, let me, before I come to you, Nii, some of these African players yeah. have been encouraged over the years to go to Europe to get licenses at the top of wherever they are. Some yes. were attached to Manchester United, yes. uh, Man City, and all the rest. So what happened to those? Uh, don't they allow them to have access to the national teams to express themselves with what they have learned to coach the young ones and at least give them the opportunity to shine before giving them the ultimate prize of coaching the senior national teams? I, I agree with you. I think many times uh, from other aspects of our lives, you realize that we don't treat our own people well. So we may send them overseas. They come back. We show them less respect. Also, there is the big C word, okay, corruption. So who gets uh, selected to play any role in organizing our teams, there is always the issue of corruption. I am sure that we, you saw, and I saw, and I'm, uh, Lamine saw, the story just before the World Cup in Ghana, where, you know, uh, a referee and a member of the uh, FA was, was caught by uh, uh, Aramayao, uh, are taking money and actually using the name of the president. Mm -hmm. So who gets selected either to be a coach or to be a player or to accompany the team is riddled with corruption. We have to, we have to solve the cor corruption, at least push it back, even if we can't up uproot it. But yes, we have those people, even when they get their uh, uh, um, qualification and they come back, I agree with you, neither the FAs treat them well and the governments don't treat them well. And behind the scenes, the governments are interfering. And FIFA says, if we catch a government interfering with an FA, uh, we, we, we will extra, um, 
push that country out for a while. So those are some of the problems. Yes, we don't treat those we train well. We don't, we don't treat them well. Let me, let me come to you. The issue of foreign coaches vis-a-vis -vis the African or local coaches. You have played the game to the highest level as a representative of Nigeria, uh, representing the Super Falcons. What do players talk about regarding having a foreign coach coach them or a local coach? Yeah, um, players, players will always play under any coach. You know, uh, as an ex-player, you know, uh, coaching, I did coaching a little bit, that's, that's not my thing. Um, but uh, players that have played for the country, I will give an example for, with the Super Falcons, mm -hmm. okay? Like Inkiro, Kosame, Messi, Messi Akide, Florence, Omagbemi, they all have their A licenses to coach here in this country. Why can't we get them back to coach the team? You will get, they had Florence Omagbemi, she went to one tournament and that was it. They changed her, brought someone else. It's the same thing with the male coaches. There's no consistency and there is no encouraging, uh, encouragement financially. They, they don't get paid. There's so much stories behind it. Do they get foreign coach and then pay them and not pay the local coaches? But if a player plays for your country, played as much as they did, may his soul rest in peace, Stephen Keshi, he had coached the national team, he became the national team uh, coach. He quit at a certain time, they brought him back. Sunday Olise, a phenomenal Nigerian ex-player. He now coaches in Europe. He came, he had to leave. Why did they leave? We need to find out why are these uh, uh, coaches, our national players, ex-players that are coaches leaving the country. There's something wrong. Why would a white man or any foreign coach come to coach the country and they stay, and then our own player, they sacrifice. They went to coaching schools, they got the, all their certification, and they can't stay. Why is that? Cisse is a good example from this, uh, Senegal. Senegal. He did well, he took the team to, uh, to the second round. Nearly, nearly. Nearly to the, to the second round, yes. uh, pardon me. Yeah, nearly to the second round. He, he, he is a local coach. So we can do the same all over Africa. Nee, let me come to you. It, it, some people find it strange that there's all kinds of political shenanigans when it comes to football. Yes. Some say that government invests heavily in football. However, the returns are scant. What is the problem here? I think, as I mentioned in the last, uh, uh, to your last question, I think corruption is one part of it, number one. Yes, um, maybe if you look at the budget figures on paper, you will say that a lot of funds are being put into football. But do they actually go to one develop players, especially from a young level? We need youth academies now. It's not that we don't know them, we have them. We need to just make sure they are working well and there is no nepotism. But I'm saying there is a, a seepage, there is dr drainage. There, some of the money that you see goes into the wrong hands in terms of corruption, so we need uh, 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 to fix that. The other thing that we need to fix, as, as my sister here has been saying, we need to be treating the uh, uh, coaches, coaches much better. And I think governments need to realize that uh, football, soccer, is so important to the people. It is the people's game. You know, I mean, it is striking to me. You know, we, we are only, what, uh, four days from last Sunday when France won. France is still in a partying mood. If you read the analysis, and France is a highly developed country. They used to be an empire, you know. They, 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 are, they are on the uh, uh, Security Council in the UN. So mm -hmm. among the most richest, well-developed countries, and even to them, they realize that football is so important. Uh, Mr. Macron has said that uh, you know, all over Europe, you've got nationalism, which I think is just the European name for tribalism, okay? And it is tearing Europe apart. 
you know, Mr. Macron's analysis is we need democratic heroes. Okay, he himself used to play soccer when he was little. He mm -hmm. went to Moscow. The best picture from Moscow is him without his coat jumping up when France won because he said, Yes, we found our democratic heroes because this will help France to heal the current issues of, uh, of uh, uh, xenophobia, of nationalism. And I hope we get to talk about, you know, how many uh, people of African descent they had on their team and they don't treat Africans well. So, but yet, Africans help them win. I'll come to you. You are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of our discussion in a moment, including our social media segment. So stay with us. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number is 202-619-3111 and the U.S. country code is 1. Call us direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to turn down the volume on your radio or television and keep your comments brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back to Straight Talk Africa live from Washington. It's time to bring in our social reporter, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. Heidi, what do you have for us today? What I do have for you, Peter, so many comments, so little time. We've received excellent social media feedback this week. The 2018 FIFA World Cup is over, and like it or not, France is the new World Cup champion. The five African teams that participated in Russia, Nigeria, Egypt, Senegal, Morocco, and Tunisia, all knocked out in the preliminary rounds of this highly competitive event. So this leads us to our question of the week, in which we asked, why did the African teams fall short in the 2018 World Cup. We're going to start here with our social media comment of the week from Facebook fan Ken Douglas Dykes from Uganda who writes, Africa's football teams fell short because all their players went to France and won the World Cup. Let's go to another comment here from Facebook fan Frank Numamanya who writes, I think football is poorly managed on the continent. There is inadequate preparation and poor resource allocation for the sports sector. As a result, players end up playing for European countries. And our last Facebook comment comes from Kashangeo Bailon from Uganda who says Africa's teams failed in the World Cup due to corruption and nepotism. Some players are very rich. They bribe selection officials and those officials select their their own people, which are their relatives and friends. Hence, the quality of the teams, the players, are compromised. And so a reminder for you that we appreciate all of our audience feedback. If you are a new fan, do drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. You can also comment on our Facebook page. Just enter these keywords, Straight Talk Africa. And do be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com. You can also join our YouTube channel. Just sign up to VOA TV to Africa. And please follow us on Twitter at VOA. A Shaka. Straight Talk Africa also streams live every Wednesday on Facebook, or you can simply go to VOA Straight Talk Africa TV program page that is on our website. And to watch us live on your mobile device, download the VOA mobile app. Now let's take a look at what is ahead on next week's program. On the next Straight Talk Africa, Host Shaka Sali broadcasts live from Zimbabwe as the Voice of America and the Zim Papers television network in Harare team up to present a presidential election debate. Zimbabweans are preparing to vote on July 30th in the first election since former President Robert Mugabe was removed from power last November. A presidential election debate on the next Straight Talk Africa. And that's where we'll leave it for today's social media segment. Peter, you and the guests have a lot of social media comments to discuss, so I'm going to hand it back to you. Thanks, Heidi. Today we are talking about the World Cup and the African diaspora. Our guests are Lami Ademu, a former Nigerian international and a member of the Super Falcons, the senior national women's team, to the 2000 Olympic soccer tournament in Sydney, Australia, and Ni Akwete 
an African policy analyst and activist. Well, you heard the comments. Any feedback, Ni? <laughs> I, I think the one that jumped at me uh, was the idea that, well, we didn't, Africa didn't do well because all the best African players were playing for France. But you know, you know <laughs> yeah. th this is the first time in 36 years that an African team failed to qualify to the knockout stage of the World Cup. Yeah, yeah. Now, previously, uh, they've qualified to the quarterfinals. They had breaking one. The latest one was Ghana disqualification yes. on being unable to qualify to the World Cup when Uruguay kicked them out. Yes. But why haven't all these African countries learned from past experiences to enable them move forward? Let me, let me come to you. Before I come to you, Neil. Um, okay. I, I will say the unwillingness to do so. We have so much bureaucracy, so much red tapes um, with African football. And a lack of planning, I think uh, people will go back. World Cup just ended. We have four more years to practice, to, put, to start planning for the next four years. And we will just relax and pick the next, next competition coming along, drop everything else. Once that competition is, is finished, that one is dropped, you pick the next one. We need, we need a broader plan for all levels of football in the African continent. We need to have a strong academies. That's where you fit into the, all, all the teams. You start with your U11, U7, U11, however you're going to start it. We start planning upwards. America, a couple of years back, there's nothing like uh, soccer. But now that is one of the major sports. I turn my TV to catch a man. The stadiums are packed. In Nigeria, people only watch uh, English Premier League on TV. They don't go to their local stadiums to watch games anymore because there's no interest. There's nothing new, nothing enticing to tell people to come. And that's where players are groomed. That's where you get players to the national team. So we need to plan, to have a broader plan for all age groups, not just competition. We do stuff, com uh, we train from competition to competition to competition. Germany get knocked out first round. I'm sure they've started planning for the next four years. Mm. Nee? Yes. Uh, do I we have any excuse? Um, not quite. The reason I wouldn't say, um, um, I wouldn't be 100% uh, hard on us, and, and thus far, I've been saying we've made mistakes. We need to look at them. There's corruption and all that. But let me also throw in this where I will make an excuse, a little excuse for, for uh, our countries. Uh, soccer is a heartbreaker, okay? Mm -hmm. As my sister just mentioned, uh, Germany, the defending champions, got knocked out. Argentina got knocked out. The, after the first two games, I thought Spain would go far because they played great. They got knocked out. Egypt got knocked out. Mighty Brazil got knocked out. And so soccer, what it does is, it, it, you know, it is, I say it's 80% merit, how good you are. But 20% of it we haven't figured out, okay? So sometimes, in fact, a good team will still lose. And, and one, one last point, uh, Peter. The, the, the finals, if you ask me, Croatia outplayed France, mm -hmm. okay? They played a beautiful game. And by the way, there are only 4.5 million people, but they have a great system for developing the people. They played a great game, but the French were ruthless. Uh, uh, Didier Deschamps said he told his players, you have to remain calm and you have to be ruthless. You don't have to be beautiful, just put the uh, ball in the net. So I think the aspect that soccer can, can uh, break your heart, and so we should understand that, yeah, we've done well by going out of the knockout stage until now. This time we didn't, which is a wake-up call. We need to do our homework because even though I say it's luck, some people think uh, luck is the reward that heaven gives you if you work hard. So we need to work hard. Well, tactically, you could see that our players at the uh, World Cup knew what they were doing. 
However, they did not play as a team. Some people said uh, that H1 wanted to show that I'm the best in my country so they could be, you know, get big contracts and all that. But my concern is that, don't you think we should have some progress over the years? Mm -hmm. um, the World Cup has been going on for so long. Yes. Um, we should know how to plan. We should have CEOs or the FAs are supposed to be independent by FIFA rules. Mm -hmm. Are they not capable of planning five, ten years ahead that this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to play, we're going to stick to what we know or how we play best to our strengths in order to be able to challenge these other countries from other parts of the world? Because we play with them on the international stage. EPL, La Liga, Serie A, even the Russian League, you have all kinds of African players there. What is wrong? Well, um, I said earlier, lack of planning. It's not just with the men. Look at the Nigerian uh, women's team or the African women's team in general. We don't go past the first round. It's lack of planning. They even put more attention to the men's team than the women's team. We only go out there when there's tournament. That's it. You play that tournament, and that's it. So they, they need to develop the sports, both men and women, uh, the Women's World Cup is coming up next year in France. We had a friendly match against France uh, a couple of ma months back. How many did France trash us? 7-1? Nigeria, the giant of Africa? I mean, we're not making progress. We're not making progress. I think we can do a lot better. Female league in Nigeria is pathetic straight up pathetic they can they can f raise uh, they can get sponsors just like they do with the men develop the league that's where we get our players it's just of recent years that the players started going to europe to pursue professional careers but primarily Nigerian Super Falcons are all players from the home league, but there's nothing there. We need to plan. We need to have infrastructure. We need to have a good league. We need to have equipment that will train these players, both men and women. But we don't do that. We will build facilities. We will abandon it. Example is the National Stadium in Abuja a massive, incredible facility. I don't think it's up to 40% usage. Oh, I'm giving it a big number. It's not being used, it's not being utilized. If we, can u we, can, we can utilize, we can build facilities, buy equipment, and train children. As uh, my, my brother here said, it can break our heart it can bring us back together. When this World Cup was, uh, for the past month, we enjoyed the World Cup, I don't care if you're from the moon, the star, the sea, the ocean, everybody sat down, everybody enjoyed. Nobody was talking about their issues, oh, you are green, you are purple. Everybody was a soccer fan, and it brought joy to everybody. I think, based on that, if they, everybody is happy because of soccer, why not invest in it and make everybody happy? Peter, may I jump on that? Sure, quickly? sure. Before we go, yeah. yes. Yes, um, I, I agree totally. And I, you know, in my day job, I'm an activist. I'm looking at policy, and my number one issue is democracy, democracy, democracy. Mm -hmm. Democracy is what the people want. And I can bet you every African country, Nigeria, Ghana, Liberia, has a, a former soccer player as president. Mm -hmm. So my, my point is, African governments need to understand that soccer is important. They should invest in it. And because the people are so passionate, we need to find a way. You are right that the FAs are supposed to be shielded from political interference. But there is a way of making soccer and sports development a national uh, uh, priority and put the money into it. The planning that she's talking about and the systematic planning, not waiting until one tournament, I agree with that totally. And I'm saying it should be made a political issue. If I'm running for president, I'm going to say here, part of my campaign is here is what I'm going to do with soccer. And you wait and see, and other sports. And therefore, I'll say wait and see how many votes, how many people will look at me 
my platform if I say soccer is a priority and sports is a priority. You, you know, in Malawi, sometimes you can't get people for political events. You have to organize soccer events in order Precisely. to draw people. Precisely. You are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa to participate in our conversation. Please call us at 202-619-3111 and the U.S. country code is 1. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, so don't go away. The lyrics could be French, English, Portuguese, Bantu, Arabic, it is the beat, the African beat that counts, the beat does all the translations, it cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat, it is so distinct and adhesive, it binds us together, African beat on the voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com slash African beat. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue, Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237, USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about um, how in some countries you need to organize soccer tournaments in order for uh, people to show up. But let me ask you, L Lamy, do players think about the fact that these FAs or the governments do not take care of them when they come for national duties. They come and play, they come down from their, uh, you know, foreign teams, come to play, they get injured, they are never taken care of. So there is lack of commitment of them to play for the national team because that is not where their bread is batted. A lot of examples have been given over the years where people come down to play, they get injured, they are neglected, and they can't go back to fit into their teams, they are relegated, they, they don't have any more money, they are broke, the government doesn't take care of them. Do players think about things like that? Um, it's a two-pronged answer to that question. You know, um, there's a concern. If you play in a European league, you know, um, that's your bread and butter. If you play in the local uh, league, you're looking for an opportunity to go overseas. And one of the opportunities to go overseas is try to get into your national team. Even if you play in the, any European or outside league, outside the country, the way to get notice also is through your, um, your national team. Mm -hmm. if, you get, if you get uh, an opportunity to play with a, your national team, I don't see any soccer player that will say no. However, it all goes back to planning. You know, not only this, this aspect of it should not only be left to the football association. They can play a role in that. But the players have to have a players association that will take care of their welfare benefits after soccer which they have to invest financially in it. When I, when, I, when I get injured, I can't go back to play. Can we get some company that will buy us insurance through the FAs where we can come back and get, in, uh, get taken care of? All those leagues in Europe, elsewhere, they have insurance for their players. The FA can do that, but the players, this should be the responsibility of their players. Nobody can take care of yourself more than you. You have to take care of your body. Bring out the initiative, do the paperwork, and find, do, do plan on it, how you're going to get covered when you are injured. Neil, let me come to you. You were a soccer player yourself when you were at the university. I mean, do players think about some of these issues? Because that is your bread and butter. If you get injured, and you're unable to play, your money will be cut out. That is absolutely true that they face this dilemma. I say it's a dilemma mm -hmm. because I think they love the game 
and they love their people, they love their countries, okay? They play overseas, they get hard currency and all that, but they are treated badly. You know, some of them even get bananas thrown at them in sports stadiums. There's nothing like coming home to play and you feel the love. At the same time, you are jeopardizing your uh, uh, income. And so I think the magic word, as Lamin was speaking, I was thinking the magic word is insurance, okay? In today's world, you can insure anything. I know of boxers whose hands get insured because that's their tool for earning their living. So all we have to do, the local FAs and the, and the governments have to find a way to insure these people because I do think that the players uh, uh, love to come. I believe they love to come and play. I hadn't even thought of the angle that Lamine brought out, that one way of advertising your wares, your skills, your God-given gifts is to play for the national team. You know, there are, I mean, Mbappe is a great player, but playing at the World Cup got him an audience, and people who never heard of him before heard of him. So playing for your national team brings you a great stage, and they want to do it, and I'm saying they also do it out of love, and the way, therefore, it should be done is in addition to players associations, the government should look at it, and the association should look at it, because all these rich uh, teams in Europe, they go to the ghettos of Africa looking for young players. And usually the contracts they give them are not very good. I think it is a government responsibility to make sure that such uh, uh, contracts include not just insurance in Europe, but that we get the right for them to return home and play with insurance so that they don't, they don't uh, take on that whole risk of getting injured by themselves. All right, let, let's go. Let's yeah. quickly, we go to the uh, phone lines and then yeah. we'll come back to you. Okay. Um, Gerard from Uganda, how are you? Hello, Gerald, can you hear me? Hello, Gerald? Okay, if I'm from Ghana, if I, how are you? Hello, hello, hello. good evening. Good evening, how are you, if I? I'm good, my name is Safa. Okay, Safa, go ahead, tell us what you think. What I think is that what, I, what, what is really African football is corruption, mismanagement, and unfortunately. That is what is really African, African football. When you look at the way national teams been organized, uh, in, I can talk about my country, Ghana, here. We have very good players. Uh, but before they can get to the national level, they will need somebody within the FA to lobby for them. Or their family, some, sometimes their family has to pay a money to the official before they can be recommended to the coach. So all the coaches that we've been putting in, in Africa here, they don't have any free hand to play. The official that will go and put them from the Europe or whatever, come and coach our players, are the same official who will determine who, 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 who will be selected play, play for the nation. If you come to our, our various communities, you see a very, very good players who have never made it even to the local uh, league level because their families are poor. And uh, all right, thank, thank you, Sefa. Your, your, point, your point is well made. Uh, we'll now head to Patrick from Nigeria. Hello, Patrick. Yeah, good evening, sir. That's Patrick Okurafo in Nigeria. How are you, Patrick? Honestly speaking, Africans were not prepared for the World Cup because of the players were playing one-man show, coupled with Africans' lack of incentives to play. Sustain any injury, you will die alone. Nobody will assist you. Look at our late, uh, late uh, Yekini of Nigeria. What is how he suffered? For Africans to still come four years' time, they should start preparing now, plan ahead. That is a, even like what the, our guest was just saying, that, that the players are not insured in Africa. That is why you know, when they come, they just play the same game. Because if you sustain any party, nobody will take care of you. Thank you very much. Patrick Okafo is my name. Thank you. Thank now ahead. And good marketers, we need them now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, Lamin, you were about to say something before yeah, the Yeah, um, I just uh, wanted to touch um, on the players playing for, for the national team with that issue. Every athlete, the pinnacle of their 
at every sport. What they achieve to do is to play for their national teams. Every athlete in the whole world, you box, you play soccer, that's the highest for them. So it doesn't, they can come and get injured, but they still want to take that opportunity. That's what I wanted to add. Okay, Nini, yeah. what, what are the steps forward in order to achieve the ultimate target? Because there were predictions that in the 2000s, um, Africa should be able to reach the finals and possibly win it. Um, do you see that happening in our lifetime? Um, I would like to think so, yes. Now, that, that prediction, of course, uh, got a lot of uh, attention in Africa, among in the whole diaspora, really, because it came from the best possible source, Pele himself. You know, so Africa has the talent. What do we need to do? I think, uh, as my sister said, we need to plan. Um, my way of putting it is it has to be a national priority. Governments have to say it is a national priority. But I stress, as you have mentioned, they are not supposed to interfere with the FAs. But there is a role for government to make it an issue. I would also appeal to ordinary Africans, ordinary Nigerians, ordinary Ghanaians, ordinary Egyptians. The whole idea of democracy is the country belongs to you. The leaders have power only because you gave it to them by voting. So anything that you think is important, you push them to do it. And if they are not doing it, you throw them out. So it has to be the people's priority. It has to be government priority. And it has to be a priority for the FAs. And then the details are having a good plan, developing players, developing uh, um, uh, how you train good coaches. And if, if I might add one thing, you know, uh, all Africa has so much uh, uh, talent. I was shocked when Ghana didn't make it. I was shocked that Cote d'Ivoire didn't make it. I was shocked that Cameroon didn't make it. And you know, Mali, Burkina, all these countries have been playing well. Hopefully, you know, in, in soon there will be nine teams from Africa. But we need to start uh, planning to make sure that we send the very best teams. We need to make it a national priority. And so, because when we don't do well, then, you know, our good players uh, uh, choose to play for some of the European teams. Understood. Before we go briefly, you have the last word, Lamine. Okay, um, planning, we talked about the coaches, we talked about the, the, the players, if they're prepared. A team consists of a whole slur of professionals. It's not just the coaches. We have the players, we have the psychologists, we have the physical trainers, we have the doctors, we have the physiotherapists, we have the dietitian. If we can get people, um, you know, you find out from the five African countries, did they have all that? Did Nigeria have a dietitian? Did they have a, a psychologist? Uh, you know, a dietitian prepare their, their meal mm. that they eat during the tournament. Did they have that? They can add Saharan Kilishi in their next tournament. Um. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to continue uh, another time. On that note, <laughs> thanks to our guests, Lami Ademu and Ni Akwete and my VOA colleague Mohamed El Shenawi, who was in Russia at the 2018 World Cup. Thanks to our affiliate stations, along with our viewers and listeners. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, Learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's Daybreak Africa with James Batty. On behalf of The Voice of America, thanks for watching and listening to Straight Talk Africa. Have a great evening.